And what we see is there's a couplet that develops during the year. During the summer, when things are nothing like crazy, a lot of running water, coarse material is carried in and laid down. And that coarse material usually has more clays and it tends to be a little darker color. During the winter, everything kind of freezes up again, including the surface of the lake. The only thing that's getting into the lake is basically the clays that were already in the water, held in suspension. And now, as everything quiets down and freezes over for the winter, those clays settle out of the water and make a thin layer on the bottom of the, the lake. Those tend to usually be a little lighter colored. So we get these layers now, these dark light, dark light, dark light layers, each couplet representing a year's worth of deposition, a summer period and a winter period. So that's cool. We just have to count up the couplets and we know how many years it took to lay down this package. But notice it's not giving us an absolute age date in the sense of, well, it began X number of years ago and ended X number of years ago. Not at all. What it's doing is it's saying it took X numbers of years to deposit this thickness of material. So it's giving us a rate of deposition. How fast does this material accumulate? How long did it take? But it doesn't tell us when it started, and it doesn't tell us when it ended. But still, depositional rate is a pretty neat thing to know sometimes. But you have to be careful how you use these. This is something called a bar. Dump, uh, when it accumulates in these glacial lakes, they're called bars. Other times, they're just called rhythmites or couplets, depending on uh, whether you know what an inflation is. Now, these last two, I, you, you just can't use with any certainty whatsoever. This, this kind of starts getting into that realm of guessing a whole lot. One of the things are lichen, and you can see this rock, and it's covered with all this colorful material. That's biological growth. It's like moss in the way. It's an organism. And you can see different colors. And if you can, say, find a bridge, and this bridge has a plaque on it that says, ah, the bridge was built in 1888. And then you look at all the lichen covering that bridge, and you look at whether it's on the north side or the south side, or how it's oriented to the sun and the rain. And you can get a feel for the density of the lichen cover, what types of lichen are there. And then you can apply that to other rocks in the area where there aren't bridge dates on them. And you can say, oh, same amount, same type, same facing north. So. The bridge was 1888, I'd say this stuff's been growing over here since 1988 also. And a little bit of a tenuous connection, right? And um, it just kind of gives you a little bit of a feel for things, but I sure wouldn't want to be known for publishing a whole lot of papers with that on it as the total answer. Another thing is uh, basically, uh, looking at boulders, this boulder has this rough, bumpy shape to it because it's been bombarding with protons from the atmosphere. And um, in particular, potassium and chlorine, um, as these atoms come in, these little high-speed neutrons from the atoms uh, penetrate the rock and modify the rock a little bit. And given enough time, it produces kind of a rough surface. So that says, aha, this rock has been exposed to the atmosphere undergoing this atomic bombardment, natural bombardment. So oftentimes people doing glacial work will use this as a way of trying to determine how long this surface has been exposed. <coughs> okay, is this just a uh, something from the last glacier, or is it really, really old looking like it's been here from about four or five glaciers ago, or is it something that looks pretty brand new and maybe just got unearthed? Again, absolute age dates are pretty tenuous, but it gives you kind of a, is it a really old or a fairly young kind of quantitative or qualitative 
aspect to it. So you have to use these guys with, with a high amount of caution. But they do get used. Okay, true or false. Carbon-14 native is very useful for rocks in the Precambrian greater than 570 million years old. 15 seconds. scientific answers for a lot of this until fairly recently. But it's been an inspiration for all aspects of our life. It's not just science, it's not just geology, but if you think about it, art, literature, all the other parts of our life are direct options of, of geology. Um, here's Milton. Uh, he wrote many volumes of Paradise Lost. This is from his book seven. And he says, in his hand he took the golden compass prepared in God's eternal store to circumscribe the universe and all created things. One foot he centered and the other turned round to the vast profundity obscured and said, thus far extend, thus far thy bounds, this be thy just circumference, O world. And there is God with the golden compass, turning out the circle that's going to the earth. And William Blake in 1794 took Milton's work, did this watercolor, and it was the frontest of what called the World War of Prophecy. Great poetry, beautiful art, and, and you look at it, and it all goes right back to that geology. Earth, where did it come from? So let's kind of look at a couple of basic uh, questions here, see if we can maybe answer them a little bit. Let's talk about the condensation theory and the solar nebula theory. These are kind of our two big intertwined theories as to how Earth came about. So we'll talk about how that, how those kind of came about and um, whether they're any good or not. Uh, let's talk about this idea that our solar system is about five billion years old. It started to uh, come together uh, within a universe that had already been around since about 13.8 billion years. So we're actually relative newcomers to our universe. And uh, I want to get across this idea of kind of how Earth is put together. Uh, that it's densely stratified, in other words, uh, the denser stuff went toward the center of the planet, the lighter stuff is kind of left out, making the, the mantle and the crust of the planet. So, uh, kind of give you some ideas of the beginnings of the way Earth is, is put together. OK, 
So what do you think is happening to our universe right now? Is it expanding, contracting, pulsing, or remaining static? In about 15 seconds. You just turned it off. It was running Oops. for like five minutes. It was burning in the background? Okay. We're going to do a real, real question then. semesters is there have been a lot of really good programs like the Science Channel and the History Channel and all, all those Discovery Channel kind of things. And I think a lot of this information is now finally kind of getting out to the general public. And what's encouraging is the general public's watching this kind of stuff. And now it seems like everybody knows that, yeah, the universe is expanding. Well, yeah, so you learned that maybe on the Science Channel, but how did they find out? Who told them? And how did, how did scientists figure this out? In the 50s and 60s, a new concept was beginning to emerge in astronomy and planetary science. And it came to be known as the Big Bang Theory. One of the leading astronomers of the time, a guy by the name of Fred Hoyle, was um, giving an interview to Time Magazine. And he said, yeah, you know, the, the evidence now is pointing to the idea that somewhere between 10 and 15 billion years ago, sometime in that bracket, just a 5 million year bracket, somewhere in there, we think that the universe started from just a, a pinpoint of pure energy and started to expand. And it was like this big bang that went on. And Fred immediately regretted that he ever said that. Because there was no bang. It was simply a rapid expansion of energy from this dense pinpoint to now spreading out rapidly through the void. But was there a bang? No, there is no noise whatsoever. The void is a vacuum. Sound cannot transmit in a vacuum. So there was no noise associated with it. But he was trying to get the idea across that it was like this big silent explosion <coughs> of energy just radiating out. But it went into the article in Time magazine. It just caught everybody's attention. And the term stuck. And Fred just kind of. Yeah, okay. They just lived with it. We've been working on this. It's a great theory. Everybody's pretty much heard of the Big Bang Theory, right? And the idea is um, that we can measure some of the background noise left over from this rapid expansion. And we pick it up as microwave background noise. It won Penzias and Wilson, uh, a Nobel Prize in Physics. They were working for Bell Labs, and it was just when cell phones were starting to come up, and wireless communication was starting to pick up. Microwave communication was the big way that they were transmitting these signals in the very early days. And there was this hiss that they just couldn't get rid of. It was there in the background of every conversation. It was really annoying. And they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And they'd have these microwave towers, these big giant horns that would you know, concentrate the microwave beam and, and amplify it. And they thought, oh, well, maybe there's something up in, in the, the amplifying the big horn. 
So they chased the pigeons out and they'd scrub it clean from all the pigeon droppings. Didn't change it a bit. And they screwed around and screwed around and finally they stumbled on the fact that what this noise was, was the background noise from the Big Bang, from this initial expansion of energy and it was still expanding and still going on. And that noise was the remnants of this, this expansion. Okay, so how are we gonna prove this? Well, it actually kind of started back in 1929. You've all heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, I bet. The guy that it was named after was Edwin Hubble. And he worked very closely with another guy, Milton Humison, and they were working uh, out at the Mount Wilson Observatory, looking at stars, and they had a brand new piece of information. And it was a clock drive that fit on their telescope. So when they put a telescope up and they were looking at a star, this clock drive would move the telescope during the night so that star was always what they were looking at. So as that star moved across the sky, their telescope just tracked it perfectly. And it was like the star was staying in position with the telescope. And that telescope could just keep looking at it and collecting light. The more light it could collect, the sharper the image. That meant they could look at stars way further away, or they could barely be seen. But now, when you could just keep the telescope trained on it, you could collect enough light over a long enough period of time that you get the image. And what they did was they put that beam of light through a prism and they split it into a spectrum, a spectrograph. And every star is going to have a little different signature. So they were able to start collecting these spectrographs of these various stars. Now what they did was they noticed as they were doing these spectrographs that the spectrographs were kind of shifting. They weren't coming in quite where they expected, where they were expecting, but the spectrographs kind of shifted over a little bit toward the red end of the spectrum. They're kind of like, hmm, what's going on here? And basically, this means that they were seeing that things were shifting to the long wavelength through the low frequency end. So they're kind of going over here to the IR end of the spectrum. And uh, the blue ultraviolet short high frequency and what was what was shifting away from. Now, why does that matter? Well, it's something that's called the Doppler effect. You've all heard of Doppler weather radar, right? That's the new thing in the last 10, 15 years. We had radar before. We could see the storms out there, but we didn't know which direction they were moving. We could just see them. And we'd have to wait and you know, take another shot an hour later and see where the storm moved to. Well, that wasn't very effective if during that hour the storm went over. But now with Doppler weather radar, we can figure out which direction and how fast that storm's moving. And now we can really help our predictions of weather and our you know, warnings for bad weather heading our way. How do we do that? Well, you've all experienced the Doppler effect. You might not know that's what it's called. But let's have a train sitting at the station. Anna's out in front, Bill's in back. They're equal distance, and just, everybody's just standing there. And the engineer blows the horn on the engine. And the sound wave from that horn moves out as a shell uh, was radiating away from that horn, going through the air as a wave of energy, and it's moving uh, symmetrically in all directions. So it's, it's a perfectly spherical shell of energy moving away from that, that um, uh, whistle. So Anna and Bill hear it at the same time at the same